Let's bow our hearts in prayer as we prepare to receive God's truth here this morning. Father God, we love you, God. We're desperate for you, God, as we just sang here this morning, Lord, we need you. God, we need you to meet us in the dark places of our hearts. God, we need your spirit to strengthen us. We need your words to nourish us. God, we need your encouragement this morning. We need the clarity, God, that only you can bring. God, we seek your wisdom. We seek your words. We seek your truth. We seek your help. God, as we gather this morning, Father, Lord, we're so grateful. We're so grateful for the ways in which you've met us this week, God. I can't help but think as I look out and I see all of the camp shirts, God. I see all of the students that endured a fun weekend and had a blast. And Lord, we were so blessed with safety and your provision. But also, God, you ministered to us, God. You met, our, uh, met us in our needs. You, you helped us to learn. You helped us to grow. And now, God, as we come back, we know, God, that you will help us to take steps in our walk with you. We thank you, Father, for the ways in which you've ministered in our lives this week. We thank you, Father, for your patience with us as we stumble through life. And God, as I look at my own life, I see myself, God, so many times as just so clumsy in my faith. And I make mistakes and I struggle to lead and God, I, I'm so selfish so many times. And yet, God, you, you look down on me with patience and love and care. And I know, God, that I'm not the only one. We thank you for that. Lord, you've challenged us in your word, in the book of 1 Peter, to humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that in due time, God, you will exalt us casting all of our weights on you because you care for us, God. And as our hearts cling to this text this morning, God, our, our, we recognize, God, the personal nature of this strategy that each one of us needs to humble ourselves under your mighty hand. For God, you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. I pray that all of us would be willing to place ourselves under your mighty hand, God, would be willing to acknowledge you in all of our ways, would be willing and eager to cast all of our weights, all of our stresses, all of our, our pressures on you. God, because you care for us and you keep on caring for us. Lord, we recognize this morning that there is no better place for us to cast our weights than on you. And so with that, God, we bring our stresses to you this morning. Lord, I want to lift up Brian and Heather McPhail Fossey this morning as they're serving you faithfully in Cameroon. And I recognize, God, the, the weights that they're carrying on a daily basis, the, the stresses, the pressures, the joys, the fears, the pains, the frustration. God, I pray that you'd energize their souls this morning that you'd help them. God, I want to lift up those in our midst who are struggling with physical affliction this morning, whether it be illness or pain or, or spiritual illness or just wrestling with depression or battling with habitual sin or those who are fighting through a joyless existence, whether it be work issues or family issues or just a self-focused outlook, God. I pray that you'd remind all of us today that it's not about us, but it's all about you. God, I pray for those today who are wrestling with your sovereignty in their hard situations, whether it be joblessness or financial ruin or difficulties or just facing unjust accusation. God, help us to remember your gracious hand amidst both the good as well as the challenging. God, help us to feel your presence this morning when all that we see is loneliness. 
God, help us to experience your divine help when the pressures of this world are pressing in all around us. Help us to know your loving hand even in the midst of situations that don't make sense, God. Grant us wisdom, O oh God, that we might see your purposes, God. Lord, as now, now as we enter into this passage, Lord, this morning, as Daniel opens the word, God, help us to see all that you have for us this morning. Help us to experience you in fresh and powerful ways. Help us to come away from this passage, God, with a biblical mindset regarding suffering, regarding pain, regarding lament. Be with Daniel this morning as he opens your truth. Help him, Father. Minister to his heart. Energize his soul. Keep him faithful to the text. And Lord, use your words to speak to all of us in a special way. Help us to leave this place this morning changed and renewed and energized and challenged. Father, we will give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise for everything that you do in us and through us. For it's in Jesus' precious and glorious name that we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the 13th Psalm. It's thir- Psalm 13. If you are here and you don't have a Bible, and, or you don't have the version of the Bible that I preach from and you would like to follow along in the same way, I invite you to take one of the black Bibles that are in the chairs in front of you. We'd love for you to take one, put your name in it, and make it your own. If you don't have a Bible or have an ESV, and we'd love for you to take one and use it, read it. And if you found, grabbed one of those Bibles, it's page 453, Psalm 13. Despair. You know that, that feeling of loss, of absolute all hope, where you can't see any light, no light at the end of the tunnel. It just goes on and on, and you just don't see it getting any better, and you're in agony, anguish, discouragement, even depression. Are you there or even near there this morning? Are you at the edge, about to drop off into despair? Maybe it's the weariness of caring for a loved one, and nothing gets better. She doesn't get better. He is not healing. Or the pain of kids walking away from their faith in God, and it breaks your heart. Or the, maybe it's the pain of not being able to gather together here and you're, on, you're on, at home online because of COVID and your health situation. Or maybe it's, the, maybe it's just the feeling that you just can't catch a break. And as one friend remarked, it just feels like at times I feel like I'm God's punching bag. Or it's the battle of Dealing with chronic sin, habits of sin, maybe lust and pornography or jealousy or envy or anger or bitterness or constant worry. And you feel the wrestlings of that and the despair that comes from that, including the guilt of not handling it rightly. Or maybe it's a job that's soul-crushing or it's your boss, or an employee, or maybe it's the feeling that you're just an inch away from poverty, or you're already there and you just are stuck in life. Or maybe it's 
discouraging and exhausting relationships with parents that just don't seem to get you. And all that doubts that God is good or He exists or this truth is real. And so maybe it's your weight or your health or your finances or your marriage or your kids or your job or your lack of discipline or all of those things combine. And maybe on top of all of that, God feels distant to you. You've sought Him. You've asked Him for help. You cried out to Him and He hasn't seemed to answer, at least not in English. And He hasn't come and He hasn't comforted you. You remember times when God's Word was so rich to you and the promises of God's truth just filled you with joy and, and they're just not there anymore. God, where are you? Can Christians who have had their sins forgiven, Christians who are children of God now, that's their status, can Christians who have the assurance of heaven in their future, can they experience these realities? I hope so. I hope so, because you've been there, I've been there. And maybe you're there this morning. And maybe you'll be there tomorrow. It's the world we live in. It's the world in which God is sovereignly ruling, but He is at work in the midst of our lives. And it's the world that David, the psalmist of Psalm 13, was in. It is obvious, both from the experience and Scripture, that God never established a no-fly zone keeping our problems away, said Paulson. It's in the New Testament, in the New Testament we read from especially the Apostle Paul and other New Testament writers of the why in which we suffer and go through afflictions. And they're big picture whys, like God is working to shape our character to become like Jesus. He's growing patience in us. He is refining and testing our faith so that we come away saying, I know God in a way I never would have unless I went through this affliction. The New Testament teaches us that. And if the New Testament teaches us that, the Old Testament, and especially the Psalms, and we're walking through the Psalms week by week here, the Psalms teach us how to express our sufferings, how to pray to God in the midst of our pain, what it means to worship in the storm, what it means to cry when we trust in Christ. David's heart is really hurt. He's in anguish. He's depressed and on the verge of despair, the feeling of hopelessness. This psalm is a lament, and I've said in the past, a lament is a kind of cry out to God in the midst of our pain where we say, ask God questions and pour out our complaints to God, and then after we pour out our complaints and our pains to God, we ask God for deliverance, and after we ask God for deliverance, we turn in a type of solid trust and even praise and thanks to God for His past help, even when we're hurting. This psalm has six verses. It's a short psalm, and it's, it's pretty easily organized. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 13. You can stare at it for a minute. I'm going to read it in just a second, but if you look at it, verses 1 and 2 are, are verses of deep sigh, desolation, despair, complaints, questions. Verses, that's verses 1 and 2. Verses 3 and 4 moves to a gentle prayer, earnest prayer called supplications, their requests to God. And then section five, section three, or verses five and six, great joy, certainty, this lament that turns to trust and praise and hope in God. So let's read it. We know it's a psalm of David, and it's to a choir master. I mean, he wrote it and said, here, this is for the people of God to go public with, to praise God with. Here it is. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all of the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I 
sleep, sleep of death, lest my enemies say I've prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Do you see a heart that goes from anguish to assurance? From brokenness to blessed to devastated to a type of delighting in God's goodness. Psalm 13 shows us, and I want to show you three things from those three sections. First of all, the complaints of a heart poured out. Let's look at it, verses 1 and 2. The complaints of a heart poured out. How long, O Lord? We get four questions, four phrases, four expressions of how long, how long. And he asks four questions. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I have to take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? And how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? What kind of mood is David in? He's on the verge of despair. Have have you been there? Have you been in that place? Are you there? Are Are you there where you say, God... Why? And, and for him, his problem, his pain is at least fourfold. First, we could say it's theological and related to God. God, I got a problem here. You seem distant. It's not that I have trials everywhere. I do have trials everywhere. But in those trials, those difficulties, the, the discomforts of my life that's going on, we don't know what's going on in David's life. But if you read First and Second Samuel, you'll see he's had There's plenty of instances where this would fit. And he says, God, will you forget me forever because it feels like you forgot me. We saw this in chapter 10, this 10th Psalm. And, And God, there is nothing I need more and there's nothing I want more than you to do the ironic blessing to me May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause my face to shine on you. I want your face to shine on me. And God, right now, it feels like you've just turned away from me. When I've prayed to you, you don't answer. When I'm going through trial, it's like you're not responding. I'm your king. I'm the man that you anointed. I am. I love you, God. Why aren't you coming through for me, God? So he's got a problem theologically. He's struggling with that because God isn't answering. He's got a problem psychologically. How long must I take counsel of my soul and have sorrow all the day? He is depressed. He is discouraged. He doesn't see any light. Things are gray. I lay in my I imagine him expounding on this and saying, I'm laying in my bed all day, all night, and I'm grieving. I can't get it out of my head. I, my thoughts just keep going back. I second guess my decisions. I worry. I have anxiety. I have regrets and I have guilt. guilt. And the things that are happening, my enemies, the things that are around me, they are troubling me. Maybe he's saying even myself, my own sin, my own problems, I'm my worst enemy and I I have sorrow all the day. I believe that there are some in this room or watching online that right now will say, Pastor Daniel, I have sorrow all the day. It could be the loss of a dear loved one and say, how long, O oh Lord, will this pain last? How long? How long... Will I mourn and grieve for this child who's away from you? How long will I endure this at work or in school or with friends or this loneliness? The psalmist knows the pain of that type of anguish. But not only is it theological and psychological, it's, I guess you could say, there's this spiritual and this social, social pain 
because he's got enemies, people that want him either dead or they're making fun of him. They're mocking him. They're rejoicing and exulting over his calamity. Whatever it is, he's going through a hard time and they're, they're looking at him and saying, see, your God, your God didn't come through for you. They're exalting over him. Or you're not, the, you're not the man that God called to this job. Or they're making it worse. I think the last problem that we can infer from these first two verses is he pours out his complaints to God. Is he says, and it's taking way too long. Have you ever, have you been and are you in a state or in a stage of your life that you just so long for God to intervene and work and you need God's help? And you prayed 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 and you prayed. And you prayed. God has an answer. Or at least that's how it feels like God has an answer. He hasn't given you what you wanted. And you cry out how long. That's said four times in the first two verses. How long, how long. God's timing to our impatient hearts is often too slow to our impatient hearts. Until maturity in our lives and time will someday show us that he was precisely on time and lovingly on time and sometimes lovingly delayed in our lives. Maybe your enemies are taunting you. It could be the enemies of voices in your mind, accusations, the enemy, lust pouring in at you, bringing guilt of past sins or tempting you to present sins to just make you feel guilty and defeated in your life. Or just the fact that prayers and burdens that you've cried out to God just don't seem to be answered. For me, it was the fall of 2013. I have had seasons in my life of discouragement, despair, and overwhelmedness. And I'll have them again. And I'll have days like that. And I'm sure you do. But I did in 2013. I felt like we felt like, our family felt like God was calling us from a pastorate in Minnesota to a, a unique situation where a camp and a college that my grandfather founded and my, I grew up at and I went to college at, it's just a tremendous ministry called Northland, was, was in some ways dying and they needed some leadership in, this, in, in a place, in a state where we wanted to cause it to survive and move on into the future and we felt God calling us to this ministry to help train pastors and missionaries and help students and kids grow to live and love for Jesus Christ. And it was scary, it was hard, and we went there. And that year of 2013 into 14 years was devastatingly hard. We went through experiences of finances at the school and in our lives being a mess. Closure at the school seemed imminent. Staff and faculty were doubting and questioning our decisions. Outsiders thought we were wrong and were mocking decisions that we were making. All of this being in a time when we were trying to pursue the path that God had for us. Yet day after day, morning after morning, evening and all the time, it felt like a nightmare. And it wouldn't go away, this awful ache in the stomach and the heart. Relief seemed to keep slipping away. God, why aren't you intervening? What are you about right now? God, God, I'm hurting. I don't think I can go on. I'm exhausted and I'm despairing. What is it for you? I know I'm, I'm failing in this area, but God, help me. David begins with complaints poured out from his heart. And that is the way God's people respond in the midst of their agony. Would you pour out your heart to the Lord? Will you continue to pour out your heart to the Lord? I've, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for this church as we've gone, as, we, as I thought about this part in the sermon and just saying, God, would you just, would you just help those in this church that are going through agonizing situations? And would you move their hearts to a type of David-like lament? God, 
God, here are my complaints. Here are my pains. But scriptures teach us not to complain about God. They teach us to complain to God. To complain to God, to cry out to God, pour out our hearts about our parents and about our spouses and about our work and about our health, our, our mental health and the loss of our dreams and our loneliness. And, our, and that is where we turn, which is where we move to the second point. You see in verses 3 and 4, we see that not only like verses 1 and 2, we see the complaints of heart poured out. We see, secondly, the requests of the heart lifted up. Verses 3 and 4, if you'll look there. He says, consider. That, that literally means turn, God. Look at me. One of our translations say, look at me. Consider and answer me. O Lord my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. If the first section is a complaint, the second section is a request to God. That's what God's people do. And he gives three requests here. If the first one had four questions, he has three requests in these second two verses. He says, consider and answer and light up my eyes. What is he saying here? He's saying, God, would you turn to me? But the thing is, David has probably already done that before. It's not like he's been complaining for a long time and hasn't asked God for help. He's Part of his problem is he's been asking for God for help, and God doesn't seem to be answering. But we see in this second stage of this psalm, he, we see faith just coming through, the buds of faith just kind of breaking through as he doesn't stop. Unbelief would say, I'm done praying, I'm leaving, I'm gone. David falls to his knees. Turn to me, O God. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep knocking on heaven's door until you answer me. God, light up my eyes. This is the idea of the idea of God, would you just refresh me? Would you re-energize re re me? Would you give me the, the nourishing power of your grace in my life so that my eyes would be renewed because right now they're just either blind or they're so dim? And he says, Light up my eyes so that I don't sleep the sleep of death. Either David means I'm really sick. This could be that David's ill and thinks he's going to die. And, and he's being mocked. Or it could be that it's like he feels like he's going to die. It's like, man, I, I'm so depressed. I'm despairing of life itself. Do you see David's faith in here? I see it as a hint of it as he cries out to God. Are you there? You need to be there. As he cries out and says, God, why do you hide your face from me? He then says, but, but God, I'm not going to stop asking because I know it could be at any moment. God, show you your face to me. I want to see you. I know you. I love you, God. And in this psalm, Dave, David gives reasons for why God should answer him. And that shouldn't teach us how we should pray, especially when we're in a time when we're desperately calling to him. We've been asking God to help us in some ways. David said, gives three reasons. He says, and they're all, they begin with the word lest. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy, which is in his mind, God's enemies. He represents God's people. He's God's man. Lest my enemies say, I prevailed over him. Lest my foes or my enemies rejoice because I've been shaken. And, and then they'll They'll say, see, God doesn't take care of his own. You see, David's making this appeal, and he's saying, God, you love me. I, I know that you care for me, lest, lest I, I die here. Other places he says, if I die, how will I praise you? And, and God, I need your help here. Would you come and help, lest I am mocked by my foe, and in reality, you are mocked. Your name I think one of the things we can just take away from here is that when God's people cry out to him, we should go to God and say with arguments, God, I'm coming to you, and I, I long for your, you to save my children. I want You love me. If you love me, I think you'll love who I love and who you gave to me. Would you now, lest, lest they drift away and others see that you don't 
care for me, but I know that's not true. You do care for me. Love my children. Would you please save them? God, I'm in this discouraged and depressed place. God, I'm called to, to shine a light and be joyous to other people because of how good you are, lest I be a bad testimony. Will you lighten my heart? And will you overwhelm me with your grace? We could turn to so many passages of Scripture that talk about God's people crying out to God. But you see, it's like in Psalm 25, turn to me and be gracious to me. I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Are you crying out to God? Are you crying out to God in your trials? In 2013, the story that I mentioned, God led me on my knees, season after season of crying out to God. When I look at my life, that was one of the seasons in my life where God was forging in my life both a relationship with Him in a deeper way. Where He said, Daniel, I know that you say you trust me. Do you really trust me? And do you know me? And are you going to cling to me like you've never had before? Because when things are going well, we have a tendency to get dull-minded and think about everything else, and we don't need God. And he drove me on my knees in those season, that season of waiting and desperation, the season of moaning. I pled with him to come visit me. I begged for him to intervene and to provide. I cried out for help and for answers and for wisdom and for guidance. I remember walking around a lake called Reflection Lake. It wasn't a reflection lake because that's where you go to reflect. It was because it was so clear when you looked into the lake, you could see your own reflection. It was a great name. But I remember walking around it, standing on the dock, crying out to God, listening to worship songs. I remember the cold during cold or muddy times and driving the suburban into the woods and just crying out to God to be alone and asking God to help me. And if he wasn't going to deliver me, he would still help me love him and trust him and feel his help. Are you there? Would you, will you be there? Will you go there? And I've said this before. And I'll say it again. When God's people are in trouble... They call upon the Lord. That's how they got saved. They called upon the name of the Lord. And that's what they do continually. God is our refuge. God says, call to me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. In the day of trouble, I seek the Lord, the psalmist says in Psalm 77. Maybe you're here this morning and you need help. You're in trouble. You, you haven't been able to tell it to anybody. Tell it to God. Maybe you have already. But it may be that you need to tell it to someone else. Ask for help. Ask help from me or the elders or the deacons or the members of this church who have been called to come alongside you and help you in this journey. We are not meant to do it alone. The Bible is not shy or quiet about our, their feelings. David, Jesus... The Apostle Paul, so many Old and New Testament characters are telling us they were in distress. It's okay for you to tell other people you are hurting or in distress. You need help. You need encouragement. It is not a moral virtue to keep it to yourself. It is one of the ways in which we get the help from God as we go to one another. I pray that you'll do that. You'll get help. And I pray that God will show himself a helper. As we find David finds help as we end the psalm. Because we see that not only does he complain. You see the complaints of his heart being poured out. And then you see the requests of his heart being lifted up. But third, look at this last two verses. The God of his heart prevails. Do you see the God of God, David's heart prevailing? See something, something prevails. In the midst of all this darkness, this I have sorrow all the day. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Verse 5. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. Do you see him clinging to truth? Do you see him saying, I've trusted in you? I will sing I, my heart will rejoice in your salvation. It's coming. I, 
My heart delights because in praises because you have dealt bountifully me with me. Do you see the heart, the determined trust? Sometimes the growth of a Christian life is to be determined in our trust. I, I trust you. I don't feel it right now, but I believe you. I feel coldness, but I know you're there. God, I don't feel like you're listening. You don't warn me when I read the word right now, but I still believe you. Oh, it's in times like that, God may be growing you like he never has before. And when the light comes on, you will rejoice all the more. Call out to the Lord. Do you see this believer in despair turn and hope to God? The idea of hope, the idea of hope is a confidence assurance that God has our future taken care of and he loves us. For David, the circumstances had not changed. It's not like he was praying that God would rescue his son from death and God rescued his son from death. It wasn't like he was praying that he would get healed. We don't know if he got healed here. We don't know any of those things other than his attitude, his heart changes, his words change at the end of this psalm. And, he's, and doubts about God are blown away as he expresses three glorious affirmations about God. He says these three things. I have trusted in your steadfast love. I call these affirmations of active patience. You, you and I need that. When, the, when, we're, when you're stuck and you're having to wait and say, how long, oh God? We need affirmations of active patience. Because we're being patient. <laughs> so we just sit there, wait, no. We need to actively be patient. And we do that by going, God, I have trusted in you. That's what he does in verse 5. I have trusted in your steadfast love. Did you hear it? Yes. David does trust. He does believe. Verses 1 and 2 are really hard. But the heart, God in his heart, the God of his heart, prevails. Who's the God of your heart? Is it this God who has steadfast love? You see, fish, we know, swim. Birds fly and, and they sing. And cheetahs run. You could name whatever other animal or things do, they do. But believers believe. Christians trust. They put their hope in God. And he says, in his steadfast love, that's a key word in the Old Testament. It's one of those words you should circle in your Bibles if you're that kind of person like to mark up. And you write in the word, you could write the word hased, H-E-S-E-D. It's an old Hebrew word, but it's a beautiful word. And it means the covenantal love of God. It means his loyal love. It means his devotion to his people that will never, ever let us go. It's translated in different words in our Bibles. Sometimes it's his steadfast kindness. We're familiar with it in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy. That word is actually steadfast love. Will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23. You see, to those who are God's people, like David was, I hope you are, his steadfast love and his goodness, according to Psalm 23, are like guardian angels that never let you go. They hound you. They follow you. They trail you and tail you. They, you can never outrun them. You can never, your trials do not remove them. You can't hide from them and you can't out sin them. God loves you and he has committed his steadfast love. He is the husband that makes a marriage covenant with you if you're in Christ Jesus. And he says, I will never let you go. I will care for you. My love. And David remembers and he says, I have trusted in your love. I remember when I trusted in your love in the past and you came through for me. And I, I trust in your steadfast love. What do you do with God's promises? What do you do with his steadfast love? You trust in him. Are you doing that? Oh, I pray that you'll do that this morning. I pray that you'll walk away saying, help, help me God to trust you more. 
Help me to believe it. Help me to dig into this book that story after story, psalm after psalm, Old and New Testament characters, you are progressing a story that shows me a God who cares about having a relationship with me and you've Put your steadfast love in me and you'll never let me go. World without end. When I die, it just begins to get glorious. That's the first affirmation. But then he, he makes a second affirmation. He says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. He is confident. You see here the, the hope that he has that's starting to well up. Far different than how long, O oh Lord, will you hide your face from me? Why are you so distant? He says... My heart will rejoice, and I'm going to be filled with joy. Yes, it's dark now at night, but joy comes in the morning. Oh, if you're a true believer in God, if you are truly saved, He puts a hope in you because you're born again according to His living hope, and He begins to put this welling up in you that God, the best is yet to come, and He loves you, and you will sing of the God of your salvation. He is your salvation The government isn't your salvation. Your spouse isn't your deliverance. Your relationships, as good as they might be, are not your salvation. Your money, your career, your hopes, all of those things in this life are not your salvation. There's only one salvation. There's only one thing that will bring you in the end, and that is the God of your salvation through Jesus Christ. And we must, like the psalmist in Psalm 62, say, For God alone, oh my soul, wait in silence. Wait, actively wait. For my hope, yes, my hope in the midst of the discouragement of loss of family, the discouragement of aching heart as I long for other things to happen that haven't come to pass, my hope is in God. Pour out your hearts to Him, O people. Hear the Affirmations of active patience. And lastly, he says, I will sing to the Lord. You you sing with praise. I will sing because something comes out of my heart. I'll sing because he has dealt bountifully with me. Oh, has, has he dealt bountifully with you? David knew that he had dealt bountifully with him. What a hope that he has. David recalls all the good things that God has done for him. Can you recall that God has dealt bountifully for you? If you are a Christian, God has dealt bountifully for you. The chief among those things is he yanked you from the pit of destruction, the kingdom of darkness, and he brought you into the kingdom of his dear son in whom whom there is redemption And the forgiveness of sins. And so you'll look, stand before a just God someday, not with terror, but with delight and humble gratitude, and say, I'm forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he'll he'll welcome you into eternal joy. And in the meantime, he has dealt bountifully with you because he gives you his spirit and he gives you. His great and precious promises by which we are conformed into the image of Jesus. Slowly and surely, as we grow and walk together in His Word and in His promises, through trials and through joys, He has dealt bountifully with you. Because He is in heaven right now for all of His children, Jesus is interceding for all of us. He's praying. He's our mediator. He cares for us. He cares about your mess. He cares about your life. He cares about your despair. He cares about your trials. He wants to bring you. He cares about your sin struggles. And he looks at you. And he'll welcome you. As you turn to him. And David says I will sing. Because the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. If you're a Christian, you have experienced the bounty of the Lord. If you have never experienced this joy of bounty, you're not a Christian, but you can become one. When he saves someone, he starts to put that in them. And it grows, and it has ups and downs, but it grows, and it's real. I remember that season of my life in 2013 where God brought joy in the midst of storm. He brought 
true hope, even though there wasn't any assurance of any good outcome from what I was praying for. I knew that my God lived and loved me. He taught me through song. He taught me through promises of Scripture. Like He works all things together for good. He taught me the power of prevailing prayer and of His nearness when all things, all things seem dark. He taught me the power of having the help of having friends to come alongside and to have patience and being able to reach out to others and being honest about it. And he taught me that the best is yet to come and he's still teaching me that because I know that I've just began the kindergarten of God's school in my life. I'm learning to trust him. I just know I know enough that he loves me and he loves you and he wants to bring you into that school and care. You see, the trials of our lives, if we're Christians, are the direct results of God's purposeful sovereignty, God's loving providence in our lives, even when it looks gray, even when the storm clouds are big. I'm wondering where you are this morning. Are you in verses 7 and 8? Are you rejoicing? Are you full of hope? singing for joy, but I've trusted in the Lord. Is that where you are this morning? Praise God, and I want to praise God with you. I want to rejoice with you. It's probably because you've gone through trials. Are you in verses 1 and 2? Are you on the verge of despair? Are you in the midst of despair? Are you in discouragement? Oh, would you pour out your hearts? Would you pour out your complaints to God and ask would you ask someone to walk with you in this room? Will you ask someone to walk through these pains with you? Don't do it alone. Ask them to help you, point you to God. Maybe you do not yet know this God personally. Not firsthand. Oh, you've, you've even prayed a prayer and got baptized and you made decisions and you did all that. It's like you don't know him personally. Maybe you're not yet under his steadfast love, his hased love that he promised to give for all those who are in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're not saved or born again. But maybe your eyes this morning are opened and you want it. Friend, the God of heaven made you and he offers to you a gift that is unimaginable. The words that we use like being saved and becoming a Christian and getting to go to heaven when you die, they're not at all close enough to describe the glory, the gift that he gives us in his word. Because it's not about us, it's about him and him bringing us into that glorious relationship. He offers us steadfast love, loyal, never dying Sin overcoming, bondage breaking, world enduring love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus. This Jesus who is God, he is the one with the Father, a Christian mystery. Jesus came and faced the despairing anguish of this broken world. Jesus came and felt the abandonment by God when he was on the cross and in the garden. Jesus, who faced the despairing anguish of a broken world, it says in Hebrews, he cried out great tears and anguish. He faced the feelings of rejection on the cross of God and of God's people, Israel, at the time as he hung on the cross. He sweat drops of blood in the garden in anguish. He faced enemies who mocked, slandered, tortured, blasphemed, and taunted him. And he did it in obedience to the Father for us. He is the Lord and Savior of all who put their trust in him, who call on him. He is the Lord of all who abandon their own pursuit of being boss and Lord and repent and follow him. Oh, surely... Surely goodness and this mercy, this steadfast love follows us all of the day, even through the valley of the shadow of death. Even in the midst of 
trial, even in the depths of despair. He actually takes those despairing seasons and he mines in the midst of them gold that lasts forever. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. We're going to conclude with the song. I want to invite you that if you are if you're needing help, reach out. Reach out to me after the service. Reach out to someone in this church. If you need Christ and you haven't really come to know Him, come to Him and be saved. I'd love to help you understand what that means. We're going to sing in response to this sermon. We're going to sing a song. I think that fulfills... I mean, we're going to sing... Of God's great love, His hope, our salvation in His greatness, His bounty to us. He is our rock. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, we are being killed all the day long, Paul says. We are like sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm sure, are you sure, that neither death nor life, nor angels or rulers, nor things present or things to come, is able to separate us from the love, the steadfast, never dying, loyal, gracious, in my suffering love that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. God, please help us. Please move us and Conform us in all that we are and all that we do into your image through our afflictions and through our calling out to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's cast ourselves and our trust on Christ.